Well, hello. Happy Wednesday. Happy Halloween. <laughs> well, this is a little late in the month. It's typically something we do the second Wednesday, but I had a little jousting match with uh, my gallbladder, and uh, the gallbladder won, but uh, it's uh, now no longer bothering me because it's gone. Anyway, it's <clears throat> like a bad recruit. And so we, uh, <laughs> I'm excited. We are happy to be with you today, that's for sure, and uh, especially on this subject. There's, there's, uh, you see, you end up reflecting on some interesting things when you're kind of forced away um, by health from, uh, from the business. And, you know, I love my faith more than the business, and I love my family, of course, more than the business. But there's not much else that I love more than, um, than spending time with, with, the, with the teams and World Financial Group. And so I really have missed that. But uh, it's good to be back on my feet. I'm actually traveling, going to have a chance to teach some teams in, in Utah, and uh, can't, I just can't wait. It's kind of like getting back to your sport when you love the sport so much. And, um, and I'm kind of just thrilled by this every day. And it's all because of the quality of people with whom I get to associate. And, um, and I got a lot of kind words from a lot of people when I was going through that stretch, and that meant a lot to me too. And so let's get into our subject. Why is WFG? A business building superpower. You know, I had <clears throat> had a chance to reflect with some people last night, and um, about how much it has meant to Cindy and I through the years to have a chance to participate in the lives of so many remarkable people um, and help them build their companies, their businesses that has changed the destiny of their lives and their families' lives generationally the same way it has for us. I don't know that I can articulate the feelings that, have, that has brought to us in our lives through the last 37 plus years. Um, it was 37 years in July, July 15th, when we submitted our AMA, so to speak, um, though we called them hiring papers back in those days. And <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a pretty thrilling thing, you know, and it's, I think it's easy sometimes to start taking some of that stuff for granted. And, uh, and like I said, when you remove from it, it you, you tend to reflect a little bit more and appreciate it a little bit more. So let's talk about our business and let's talk about our company and the way we designed it. I remember sitting around a little table, and there were just three other people at that table. One of them was, was Monty Holm. And we were talking about what we wanted this company we were going to start to become. You know, how did we want to do it? You know, how did, you know, how did we want to build this system and implement it and teach it? You know, and I, and I think of all the BPMs and, and uh, again, back in, the, in 1980 when I started the business, we called them opportunity meetings, not the greatest name, but all the same, you know, we introduced people to our company. And I did that again and again and again and again and during the heyday of the base shop building and, you know, when we were building that first great wave of leaders. Um, <clears throat> it was it was a powerful thing to watch our business model take form and watch other people begin to understand how to do this you know and and I loved standing up in front of people in front of guests and talking to them about what we did and why we did it and why things were 
why the opportunity really did present itself in such an extraordinary way. And in a way, that's what I'm going to do with you. You know, we've obviously got people on this call that have been um, in the business for years. You know, but it's it, it's not a coincidence that the people who give these kind of meetings and are to do lots of one-on-one -on -one recruiting presentations over and over and over again end up being the most excited about the business because we pass all these things through our mind and our hearts again and again, and we emotionally connect with people over it. And so don't, you know, as you, as you look at this and you listen to these things and reflect on these things with me, you don't want to keep it a secret. You want to be talking to people about it, people on the team, people who aren't on the team yet, you know, and, and you don't over, you need to over promote it. The reality of our success story and all the good things about our business and business platform <clears throat> don't need to be exaggerated. And exaggeration is a nice way of talking about you don't need to lie. You know, another word, modern phrase for lying is over-promoting. Um, you know, another one is spin. You know, and, and I, you know, I don't like those things. I don't like those words. We've never needed it. We've got plenty just sharing it straight up. And besides that, you over-promote, you, you, you guarantee under-delivery. You know, because you can't live up to a lie. You know, and so as we talk about these things, I want you to think about sharing them with others. But, but sharing it in a straightforward and very honest and honorable way. And so people can count on you and look at you and look to you as a leader that uh, they can count on, really count on and depend on, that they're proud to introduce other people to. But you do need to get a clear understanding in your mind as to why we are the way we are, you know, and the strength of it. So let's go ahead. <clears throat> let's talk about first. The reason we're a business building superpower, first and foremost, and most, is because of the good that we do. First and foremost, the good that we do in the marketplace. You know, I went into home after home after home and after home. And while that was a lot of work and a lot of nights um, and a lot of weekends building our company, I miss it. I don't get to do, I don't do that much anymore. But the one thing that, you know, in the beginning, the right word almost would be startled. That startled me is how dramatic the need has been. You know, and years ago it occurred to me, I'm going to put up two words there, doctor analogy. What does that mean? <clears throat> you know, in the, in the world of medicine, which I became very familiar with this last couple of months, again, um, you go to, your, what do they call the family doctor? Your primary care physician, they call them nowadays. You used to be called general practitioners, but it's your kind of all-around doctor, right? It oversees the health. And they kind of have a, a, a wide knowledge of a lot of different things. But then when it's targeted, you know, as the doctor was looking at the results of a blood test of mine, he goes, the liver's elevated. Your liver's stressing out, which means something's going on. And, uh, and so they did then. He got a tech specialist that does an ultrasound. And this person looked and said, you have a gallbladder full of rocks, and it looks like maybe one's gone into this duct, and we need to get this stuff out. Well, then that turned over to a, to a surgeon and turned to another specialist that uh, is good at getting a stone out of a duct, and then the surgeon, of course, removes it, but then I got an infection, right, and now you get an infectious disease doc, and they know bacteria and all this stuff, and what to treat, and what to look for. Then I went to a CAT scan, and now you have this specialist radiologist that read these things, you know, and it's just, first, praise God for medicine and the inspiration our Father in Heaven's given mankind to improve themselves, 
because uh, I would have been literally doomed without it. But I think of all of that, all of those resources, all of that knowledge, all of that expertise, all of that technology that stood ready, the blessings, of course, being in a nation like ours, right, that stood ready to help me, right, and help our family. And you look out at the world, and the majority of people in our two nations, in the U.S. and Canada, and there's no one there. Where are the general practitioners? When you're sick financially, who are you going to? When you don't have a lot of money, if you have millions of dollars, then I might be able to suggest you aren't that sick. But if you had millions of dollars, I mean, all you got to do is, you know, mention it to someone with one of the prominent companies, and they'll be all over you. But when you're struggling and you're in debt, and you don't have much in the way of savings, and with some help and some organization and some inspiration, you decide, well, I can scrape together a couple hundred bucks or two or three hundred bucks, or, and sometimes it's less than that, right? <clears throat> and I can get started. You know, I've told the story again and again how Cindy and I got started, and we figured, you know, we could put $25 out a month to start, and that bought a little term insurance policy and a little tiny savings plan. But it began for us then. And we started building a habit of saving money. It was a little amount, but the amount wasn't important. It was the habit. And as I started going out into homes, the most obvious thing in the world was how much people needed this help. And it, and it wasn't about me. It, it was about them. And I wasn't calculating my commissions and rubbing my hands together and saying, I'm going to get rich. No, I, I aspired to great things for our family. But it wasn't about that. I was in the home. I was a guest in the most important place in the world, a home where a family is growing. And I always considered it a privilege and still do and always will. And I'd sit across and we'd talk and we'd think about these things together and I'd ask them questions and they'd start thinking about things sometimes seriously for the first time in their lives. And then I'd gather information so I could do homework. And I loved coming back, showing them what could happen. And overwhelmingly, in the great majority of circumstances, they couldn't save enough to reach the goals that they had set, but they could start, they could start though, just like I had, Cindy and I had. And we start building that habit so that when we started making more money, we kept feeding the habit. And... And so I thought, that's the kind of company we need. We need to be an army of family practitioners, of primary care doctors, only from a financial standpoint. And that we had specialists. We had money managers running mutual funds, and we had insurance companies designing ins you know, term and IUL and VUL insurance products that were the best the industry had seen in its hundreds of years of history. Only nobody was taking that stuff out to these people. You know, and, and I got excited about what we were and what we could become. And I've, I'm spending the time on this very first point to you because I know there are too many of you within the sound of my voice and too many leaders that don't see it enough that way, don't see it as the privilege that it is, don't see it for the power and importance that it has in people's lives. You know, as we protect them and we start them saving and we start them saving in wise ways and tax advantaged ways and conservative ways that allow them to preserve what they've got even when times are tough. You know, I want to mention a fact here it's just interesting. We have 50 states in the United States, and I can't speak for Canada. I don't know exactly what the circumstances are, 
in your provinces, but there are only four states in the United States of the 50 that require some kind of financial education in high school. Now, we know most of them wouldn't pay attention, but at least you get a chance to start hearing it. Only four states. One of those critical things in life, and uh, by the way, I tell you, if you lose your health, you sure aren't worrying about your money at that standpoint, except as a relief that your family is going to be well provided for, right? But it's amazing to me that something as critical as this, you know, I thought about that year they pounded on me in my sophomore year in high school about geometry, and I walked out of that class the last day of that, that second semester, and uh, all I remember is that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You know, what, how much more benefit would it have been to have pounded me on me for two semesters about what I needed to do in order to become financially secure in this lifetime? And that the sooner I got started, the easier it was going to be. But we don't do it. And you think about most of you as parents, I mean, how good a job are you doing that with your own children? Shoot, how good a job are you doing? And then how good a job are you doing passing that on to your children? Now, I stand convicted of the same thing. That's why I mention it. I wouldn't be on you. you know, I'm on myself. I'm literally driving with my son two days ago to a follow-up appointment, um, doctor's appointment, and he said, Dad, I was worried enough. And I thought, when you were sick, wait, he has a bunch still to teach me. He hasn't taught me all that I need to know about saving money and stuff. And I was that's embarrassing to admit, right? that my youngest son thinks that I haven't taught him enough in that arena. And, um, and he's right. And then we just talked about that for a few minutes. And I plan on rectifying that situation. <clears throat> but the reality is, we're it. For a lot of the middle class and the world out there, I mean, if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. That's the prominent reason we're powerful. It's a prominent reason you need to become good at this. You know, and, and need to get where you are a competent family practitioner. Because you think about it, where do people go to finan get financial help? Their bank? Are you kidding me? They'll put you in a CD at a percent or three quarters of a percent? Or some joke like that? A brokerage firm? A Fidelity? A Schwab? A Morgan Stanley? When you don't have... Hardly any money. You're going to go to the Human Resources Department, HR, at where you work. I mean, that's the blind leading the blind. You're going to go to an insurance company. How do you do that? You know, how does a general person do that? Do you go to your broke brother-in-law for advice? You know? I mean, it's just crazy. You know, how little real help there is out there. And, and it's amazing I remember, well, I wanted to go take the time to go into that. But, the, but one of the realities, this isn't rocket science. This isn't some amazingly complex thing where you've got to be some super nerd and speak logarithms and sit there with <clears throat> some amazing calculator and, and work this stuff out. You know, this is, you spend a dollar, what do you get for it? You know, where are there competent people who know what they're doing and managing money will take small amounts, you know, and, and have pretty good track records. Doesn't guarantee the future, but they've already proven they know their stuff. You know, if I just brought a guy into a baseball team that I own and he had 40 home runs and stole 40 bases and was a golden glove outfielder, I got a pretty good feeling about what the next few years are going to look like. And... <clears throat> with that player, you know, and can give me some confidence. And, but what about, what's the difference between term and IUL, and what are the variations in IUL, and what's a variable universal life policy, you know, and all of this stuff, it's just, you know, when we talk about a class, if you had one class for two semesters that just taught about what we do, you'd get it all. I don't mean just all the financial stuff, I think you get the system too. Now you've got to build your confidence and you've got to work on your intensity and your desire and your focus. 
But the reality is there's not this huge body of information that you've got, like in medicine, you know, I mean, think about it. You know, you got to have a college degree, then you got four years of medical school, four rigorous years, and then you got to have an, a year of an internship and two years of a residency. And so you literally have been through 11 years of education, and you become a doctor if you pass the exam, you know, the, the test. <clears throat> You know, I mean, that's crazy, but we don't have that. And it, you know what? And you ought to, I bet you most of you need to apply yourself more. Study your industry. Know your stuff. Become a reasonable expert in our basic things. And, um, and great things can happen in your life because of it. And just as important to me, great things can happen in other people's lives because of it. I love the fact that we do a financial needs analysis. Now, I mention this because I think very sadly, some of you in the sound of my voice don't do that for the consumer. And shame on you. Shame on your leaders if they're not teaching you to do it. You, we need to help families develop clear goals and then a clear path to reach them. You know, we just put a little thing there that says A with an arrow toward B, if you're just listening to this audio. I mean, people need to go from A, where they are, to B, where they want to go, where they want and who they want to become financially. And we help them say, okay, you're here. Let's define it. Here's what you have. Here's what you'd like to, by our talking about it, here are these goals you'd like to have for your children, for you and your spouse. <clears throat> and here's what you've got to do every month and at this rate of return, and in this kind of tax situation, in order to get there. And, and as you look at this, and, and I mean, my favorite part of the presentation in the first one was gathering that information. I connected with them. We gained a little bit of their confidence and trust, and we gathered that information. And they started getting excited about looking at what it was going to say and then coming back, recommitting them, and then showing them what that needs analysis said and then showing them how to get started on that path to get them to the promised land financially. You can tell by the way I'm talking about it, I never got tired of it. I got physically tired, but I never got emotionally tired. And physical tire was easy. I took and which once got some sleep. And it's interesting, you might not think this is where does this phrase come from? But I just put up the words recruit from the heart. See, a lot of you recruit for the wrong reasons. I heard one leader call it stupid recruiting. You recruit for recognition. You recruit for a, a place on a leader's bulletin. You recruit to get an award at an event. You recruit to get an award at the convention. So you can be all proud of yourself. And I don't recruit people for that reason. I recruit from the heart. I challenge all of you to recruit from the heart. I recruit because we have a great work to do. I recruit because we need to help people, and we need to help more people faster. That's why you should be here. That's the, the greatest thing about our company. It's why we built the dang thing. It's why we spent all those hours and days and weeks and months and years doing this. Not so you just make some money and show off. It's so we could change lives. And so I recruited people to this, this stuff I just talked to you about. I wanted to want it because of this. I mean, I, I've made my first 20, 30 sales in those, that first couple of months. <clears throat> How many sales did I make the first couple of months after getting licensed? 
23 the first month, 25 the second. So 48 sales. You know, and I was getting checks, and I was thrilled to get them. I mean, don't get me wrong, of course. We were poor. I was excited in a new marriage to be prospering. But I wasn't doing that, like calculating it in my head. I know people that go in and calculate it before they go. You know, I just, I just think you're going to come at it wrong then. You know, I mean, they got, I was there for them. When I'm recruiting somebody, they got that I'm there for them and that too with this opportunity, but also that I wanted them to get them, I wanted them to help us do this. <clears throat> to help us redirect. I wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for the medical profession and its advances and its science. And the special antibiotic that killed the bug that was growing in me. And <clears throat> I'm grateful for it. Really grateful. And don't go through that kind of experience without stopping and taking a look at the things that mean the most to you and thinking about what it means. And it's true for me in this company that we've built. That's why I wanted to talk to you about this stuff today. If you're not in it for the right reasons, even if you make it, which you probably won't, you're not going to do the good that you should do. You're not going to make the difference that you're in a position to make. All right, thanks for wading through that part with me. Um, obviously, that's been pretty emotional. So let's go on to the next slide. One of the reasons, the other reasons, that we can be and you can be a business-building superpower, besides the good that we do, is if you work at making yourself truly a character-based leader so that you can provide character-based leadership. It's by far the most important kind of leadership you can provide. We all live in a deteriorating world morally. And the challenge with starting to think selfishly and not being a servant leader is, is that we then struggle with our decision making. You know, even as we, and our company continues to draw overwhelmingly good people because our system is built on helping other people in the marketplace and of course with the team. I couldn't have advanced to my first promotion or my second or my third, much less senior leadership stuff, had I not been willing to devote myself to building others and their businesses in order for mine to grow. The thing that's wonderful about strength of character is that we then have the privilege of enjoying good decision making. You know, and <clears throat> that we have some pretty good people at the corporate level that make good decisions. I think first and foremost about Joe DiPaolo and the kind of man he is, his wonderful wife, his family. And I think of the hundreds, thousands of field leaders that are making good decisions, not just selfish decisions. You know, but there's some that struggle 
I think we all have lessons to learn. We all can constantly, constantly be improving. There's no point in life at any age where you can turn it off and it's okay. You know, and the cool thing about character-based leadership and the power of your business is you end up being an excellent mentor and a coach. People feel your care, your concern, your interest, because it's sincere. And it makes for some pretty special friendships. It also makes for a pretty awesome brand that you would have for yourself and your family and your business, your team. You know, and this requires me to talk a moment about the difference between short-term and long-term thinking. <clears throat> There are all kinds of situations that present themselves to you, you know, in leadership. And you're working with somebody, and they're struggling. And you've got to sit down with them and talk about the tough stuff. But you've got to coach them on the things that you need to help them do to improve. And you need to do that thoughtfully, and you do it respectfully, so respectfully, but you got to do it. I would wade into people's lives, like wading into a swimming pool, until sometimes I was up to my neck in it. But I'd talk to them about how they treat people. If I saw them in a relationship and they weren't doing that well, you know, I mean, they weren't, they were being disrespectful to each other or whatever it was or quick to anger, whatever it might be. I coach that stuff. It's hard. It's easier to avoid it. But that's short-term thinking. I'm thinking long-term about who I knew these people wanted to become. And I certainly knew they wanted to be happy. We all do. And there are certain behaviors that don't bring happiness and certain behaviors that do. And it all comes from your understanding of character and morality and doing the right thing. <clears throat> And you've got to just stay on it and on it and on it because your team changes. And people need, even the people that are sticking around, you know, and there are plenty of them, but they need to keep hearing it again and again. There's some of you that have been around a long time, I heard this many times, and I know it's hitting you again. Just like it hits me when I talk about it again. And so... We've got to think long term. In the marketplace, I'm sitting with a with a family, and I'm they're thinking short term. They're spending all their money. They're not you know they're not building toward a, a future you know, and they're setting that terrible example for their children, passing that lousy legacy on to the next generation, who then pass it on to your grandchildren and great grandchildren, or you can turn it around. And you can start thinking long term and helping them think in terms of 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. Cindy and I sat down two nights ago, and we did planning for the next 15 years. In 15 years, I'm 80 years old. But we were looking at our financial goals and the things we were saving money in. And, and you know, just, you know, that's the habit we have. One day it will be the end. And that will pass to the next generation. And I promise you we'll have passed these, these principles and understanding. And we have been passing on the character-based stuff all along the way. And it's a pretty glorious thing as to what the future holds for our family multigenerationally. Don't you want to do that in your family? Don't you want to do that, help other people do that in their families? And part of character-based leadership is dedication to them, to the consumer. You know, our culture, our nation, our government, a lot of Wall Street suffers terribly from the lack of commitment they all have to serving the people they're there to serve. It ends up being about power and money and fame and, you know, and you, our government 
20 trillion upside down and getting worse every minute and nobody wants to face it you know and and the consequences are going to be dire just like it would be if your family was in terrible debt ultimately it falls apart but you know as an individual you declare bankruptcy once they even let you declare it twice you know but what happens to a nation when they declare bankruptcy and it's the United States I don't know if we'll end up there we're on the path another reason you need to help individuals and families and you need to get your act together right because you can keep your head when everybody else is losing theirs you can take care of the people that you love and I want you to be dedicated to those people and I want you to be dedicated to your team. And so I hope you're getting a feeling that I'm recruiting you from the heart, that there's great good that we do and there's great need for it. <clears throat> and the greatness of our company and the reality of us be continuing to be a business building powerhouse is critically tied to character-based leadership, right thinking, right decision-making, long-term thinking, that provides great mentoring to people. And then people feel our dedication to those things. All right. Now we're going to take it a little more, you know, what did I say? Closer to the ground. Let's talk about the strength and earning power of our industry for a minute. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but this is important. You know, our industry is centuries old. It's interesting, the insurance part of our, our industry started in 1760 in the United States. 1760, I don't know when it started in Canada. Look that up. It's measured in trillions. One of the few industries that is, the other one is government debt that's measured in trillions, as I just mentioned. But this is measured in trillions accumulated. Commissions are in the tens of billions annually. You know, we pay out hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to our field force for going out to do something that helps people. It's a wonderful thing to participate in. I mean, I've, We've taken great delight in it through the years and plan on taking great delight in it in the future. It does well in good times or bad. You know, and that, I, I have come to appreciate that because in the 37, we're in our 38th year in the industry, and we've seen a lot of ups and downs and recessions and like the terrible setbacks in 2008, but I've seen something called Black Monday and Black Friday and Black other days and uh, in in the stock market and in the economy and recessions and and yet I've seen booms too and uh, I've seen I've seen the prime rate this was early in my career at twenty percent you know mortgages at eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two and obviously nobody's buying houses at that point. You know, and and yet our business rocked during those times. The more insecure people get, especially in the middle class, they have nowhere to turn. And so when you show up, they're kind of excited to listen. That fear was a, big, a great motivator, you know, just like we rocked out of 2008 and had tremendous growth years. And we've grown this year, but not like we did those – First four or five, you know, what? A, yeah, four or five years after 2008, and the market dropping 40 percent. And so, I love the power of our industry that way. I'm, I mean, Cindy and I, we talked. She, we have the best business in the world. She was talking to a great group of spouses. I think there were 5,000 people on that call with Raj and Jazz Dollywall last night. Two just wonderful leaders, wonderful. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think we have better. Anyway, before I turn this into a extol the virtues of how awesome Raj and Jazz are, Raj and Jazz, let's go ahead and continue and finish the webinar. You know, another thing that I love about our industry right now, the product quality and the design of products is superb. As I mentioned, the best that they've ever been. You know, we are a real stagnant industry for, gosh, better part of a century. You know, and we've been part of that movement that caused this change. You know, and <clears throat> I'm proud of that. It's one of the things I'm proudest of. So a century old, measured in trillions, billions paid out every year. Does well in good times or bad. Tremendous products to take to the consumer. The market need, don't need to dwell on it, is overwhelming. You know, it literally overwhelms me sometimes. You know, and traditional distribution to families has declined. Now, all that just spells opportunity with a capital O and, and, a, and 10 exclamation points. You know, it's just a wonderful thing. And I want to dwell on this part and give it its own slide. You know, they say the, the key to great comedy is timing. Well, I think the key to having or, uh, average and ordinary people like myself end up having extraordinary success in business, and I worked hard and all that stuff, but you, know, you, you listen to Warren Buffett, right? The greatest money manager in, in history, you know, and <laughs> of civilization. And he credits timing as the key factor. He said if he'd been born 40 years earlier, it, he wouldn't have had the experience to have. If he'd been born 40 years later, he wouldn't have had the experience that he had. But growing up in this economy, in this nation, and building the business that he did, allowed him success that was ended up being supercharged. Well, we've got that going for little old us, right? For each one of us. And so let's just reflect on it a minute. There are fewer agents fewer registered reps, fewer investment advisors in the industry right now than ever. There's increasing uncertainty and fear of the future because of debt, because of government's unwillingness to attend these things. They just add more things that cost more. I mean, it's like being in terrible debt as a family. You just you go out and buy stuff every day. You know, you just can't stop yourself. We all know where that ends up. It ends up going over a cliff. And so people are right to be concerned. But that, that concern needs an outlet. You know, and that outlet needs to be you and me going and coaching them. There's greater need, less industry capacity to help. This is a sad story, but the reality of it creates tremendous timing for us in our businesses and because of this people are more receptive and willing to listen now you're going to still have people just like at a governmental level that reserve the right to remain stupid and they won't listen and they won't make changes and they keep doing this dumb stuff but that's okay go talk to someone else because there are going to be a bunch of people that appreciate it and so it's great timing for our model, great timing for our products, great timing for you to build a business. Man, it's tough to build a business, but try and have it be bad timing. You know, try and start a real estate firm in the second half of 2008 and the next few years afterwards. And try and do it when interest rates were skyrocketing as the Fed was trying to control inflation, you know, in the 80s. Hmm. And so <clears throat> this is a wonderful thing that's completely in our favor. Make the most of it, but do it from the heart, right? Now, I want to finish, is that finishing? Let me look at the head. Yeah. 
this is the last slide. And I want to finish with what I hope is powerful for you. And that's the power in your life and the lives of your team and in the marketplace with the consumer. The power of their motivation, the power of your motivation to change your stars. That's kind of the way I've said it for a bunch of years now, changing your stars. I saw a movie, and it was about a story set in England centuries ago where a poor man, there you had royalty and you had commoners. They had words for it, royalty and commoners. <laughs> it's still a term they use, right? Kate, Princess Kate, was technically a commoner. You know, and... <clears throat> And we all know who got lucky in that marriage. I think she got a good guy, but he got a great woman, just like in my life. And, and this person had to fight through these cultural limitations and, and strata of society to change his stars. You know, it wasn't even a great movie, but I remember the line of a little boy turning up to his dad and saying, can a man really change his stars? And other people around him, when they overheard it, laughed at him. They were all commoners. They were all peasants. And the father said, yes, son, it is possible. You know, and I'm telling you, as your friend and your teammate, you can change your stars here. I'm proud of our company. I'm proud of what we built. I'm proud that WFG doesn't care where you came from. Now, we care if you came from 30 years in prison. <laughs> it's really the regulators are going to care about that, too, because you got to get a license, and that would make that obviously a challenge. But we don't really care where you come from. And, and the common way of meaning that. Because the thing that's going to make you successful here is not your education. It's not your grades that you got in school. We don't ask you for your transcripts. College asks you that when you're coming out of high school. But I don't care. When we're not even overwhelmingly concerned about your financial statement. We're one of the few companies, agencies out there that can get you an appointment with a company, sometimes even if you've been bankrupt, even if your things are tight. All right? A lot, of, a lot of companies just decline you. They don't won't appoint you. They think you're too big of a risk that you write some bad business and run off with the advances. But our people just don't tend to do much of that stuff. So I love our company because we don't look at you in the terms of your degree, your grades, your financial statement. It's really the ultimate equal opportunity. And it's not an equal opportunity employer, which I'm sure Agon and WFG Corporate are. <coughs> I know they are. But here, we live it. We don't care about any of that stuff. We do care about your character. We do care if you have, can conduct yourself with integrity so you can build something lasting and do great good. But none of the other traditional stuff. You know, if I went down the road, up the road to Google or over there to Apple or up to Facebook or over to Tesla or all these Netflix that's down the road the other way, all these companies here in Silicon Valley that are around me, I applied for a job. One, they would do this. They think I was too old. Two, I don't have an engineering degree. I don't have a tech degree, right, in, in one of those areas. You know, I know what a logarithm is, <laughs> but I'm done. I watch people work hunched over their laptops and, and writing code and getting any apps to work, you know, and 
I respect it, admire it to a point. I don't know how to do it any more than I knew how to do what those doctors were doing for me. And so I probably wouldn't qualify. They wouldn't hire me. But WFG, I came in. I had managed to get through college in seven years, got a degree, no background in the industry, no background in sales, no background in anything having to do with financial services, no great leadership experience, no track record, financial statement that the needle was bouncing on empty, you know, and they said, hey, let's go. And I started getting coaching, and I was determined to listen and be coachable. And we changed our stars. You know, two and a half years later, we had a million in savings. When we started, we had $800. $800. How bad do you want it? I mean, that's your juice right there. That is the power of your motivation. How bad do you want it? Are you going to be some freaking pansy? Somebody says no or doesn't show up to the meeting or your brother-in-law says he thinks it's stupid or somebody looked on the Internet and read some bad thing, which you can read about everything in the planet, you know, and, and you cave in. Well, all that stuff happened to me, too. And it hurt. It wasn't fun. But it didn't make me think about quitting. What it did is it made me mad that people were trying to stop me. And I wasn't going to let them. Because we wanted it bad. We wanted a better life. I didn't want to stay in that mobile home. I didn't want to stay in that rental and that's not the most important things that we overcame. How much did it mean to me when I was laying in that hospital bed knowing we were secure, that my children were secure, my great-grandchildren were secure, because we wanted it bad and we paid the price. That we could take care of our family for the next three generations. even though we didn't have any kind of resume to show. Man, I appreciate the chance to win. But some of you, a little bit of adversity. And when, when, when. And this is another line from a movie I saw. Do you want cheese with that wine? Only it's not W-I-N-E, it's W-H-I-N-E. Look, if you're going to be the hero of your own life, you go make it happen. You don't whine. The hero goes and makes it happen. You face an adversity, go face it. You need to challenge something, go challenge it. You need to step up, step up. That's the power of your motivation. I get pumped up talking about this stuff. I just got my voice back today. They stick these tubes down your throat, and you, you kind of sound like you're gargling gravel for a couple of weeks. Nice. I'm pumped up. My throat's a little sore, but I'm excited. You see, my family was poor. My parents lived in a mobile. My dad had a little job managing a tiny golf, nine-hole golf course in the center of a race in Sonoma County Fairgrounds. A lot of where I grew up burned over the last few weeks. And we were, there's this the racetrack they have with, you know, one one all that stuff, the electronic, it was mad. We had a home behind that. Just the first tee. Wake up, sometimes people would be cheap from the tee right in front, front of the door.
Can you hear me again? Test, test. Someone text us here. Hello. Okay, Mike McCormick says yes. Dang it. Now can you hear me? Because it just shut down again. Heart of Silicon Valley. Don't know what to tell you here. Still got you. Okay, I'm still getting this. This is we're getting this network connection cannot be established. Now it says it is. Hallelujah. I'm just thrilled that a couple of you are still left. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. We had over a thousand people on here and <clears throat> And the system blew up. Like I say, it's what happened. You were in the heart of Silicon Valley. Stuff's most not supposed to happen here. <clears throat> well, I remember where I was at. <laughs> and so let me conclude. I don't know how we're going to jury rig this thing to make it sound okay. But um, I appreciate the 584 locations that are still up. Love you for it. And so I did talk about my family being poor and gave you, ho, oh, where'd it go? Where'd yeah. Okay. I don't know. It just shut down again, which is screwing up. Okay, I bet you can't hear me now. Mike, can you still hear me? You still can. Okay. I'm getting no visual on the computer. This thing is screwed up. <clears throat> so we're bad. I don't know if we're battling the system itself now. Um, we'll have to check with our provider here. But I just, I would just made the point that our mentors had mentioned they had got 17 years without a vacation. We don't we have people who can't go seventeen days without taking time off. Or seventeen weeks. It's pretty amazing to watch those who really do apply themselves. Now don't get me wrong, while they were doing that, there were company trips, you know, but they were running those things. And I promise you they took little weekends, three day weekends and stuff like that. But they didn't take two week vacation. Because they wanted it bad and something amazing was happening with their company. And I'm not telling you you've got to go 17 years without a vacation. But the reality is you've got to be driven enough to understand and to apply yourself over an extended period of time that allows you to end up in a place most people don't ever end up. I think about a guy like Rocky Shee who works and he and Amanda, Miranda work and work and work and work. And I remember even my own parents saying, we think you're working too hard, which is why they were where they were financially. And where, why we ended up where we are now taking care, being able to take care of them. Because we paid a price. And we worked at it. That's the power of your motivation to change your stars. We decided that what had been happening to our family for generations and my family, my father, my uncle, my aunt, and my grandmother almost starved during the Depression. They'd been abandoned by my grandfather, and the family hadn't stepped in just to give them food. They'd have been in dire straits. From that legacy, my father came, and that was the environment and mentality I was raised in, and I had to change that to change my stars. And I got great mentoring and started reading good books, listening to the right kind of people, and I went, Cindy and I busted it to do that. And she did the same thing. But I'm going to say it to you again. <clears throat> Heroes make their own destiny. And so do you. 
gosh, be the hero of your own life, right? And so that's my challenge. Ah, it's good to be able to talk again. It's good to be able to move again. Our next webinar, I don't know if you're seeing anything now because I'm we got nothing up. So let me tell you verbally. It's uh it's called Take a Swim with a Shark. A shark's gonna be me. I'm a good shark, a nice shark. I like shark tank. That's November eighth. That's just in a couple weeks. Nine AM Pacific. And I'm going to talk to you about what your business ought to look like, how you ought to be measuring it, what things are most important, what adjustments you need to make in some of these areas. You know, if you have the right focus on the right things consistently, then you're going to be in much better shape than a lot of people go around just kind of looking over here and then looking over here and then paying attention to this and then getting excited about that, and they're all over the place. <clears throat> you know, the key to a lot of people's success, all the big players, they have this relentless focus on the basics. And so we're going to take a swim together. You know, and uh, a shark has a relentless focus. The next meal, the next bite, and I'd like to think it's, uh, by the time we're done next week, you'll have a little bit more of that same kind of focus. For those of you that hung in there, thank you. I love you even more. Wish I could give you all a hug. I really do. It's great to be amongst you again, even if it's only electronically and even if it was the technology was struggling. And uh, we'll have a little chat with the folks who provide this and see what the issues were. Thanks a lot. See you in two weeks. Talk to you in two weeks. I appreciate you. And uh, goodbye.